He had a medical. Oh. <laughs> he had a med Ron had a medical procedure yesterday, so he's he's not really up to it yet. I, I know, and I was gonna actually. He gets mentioned in this as well. So okay, kind of cool. Yes. Okay, welcome everybody to our June 2021 uh, meeting for Five Miles from Anywhere. Um, just as a reminder before we get started that um, there will not be a meeting in July. We are going to take our own little hiatus for July. Um, but we will be back in August. And I'm not 100. There's two different people I'm going back and forth with for the speakers of August. I can't announce it yet. Um, but I can guarantee you the August speaker is going to rock whoever it ends up being. <laughs> okay. And whoever doesn't will probably end up being the September one. All right. So um, if you were here last month, you probably have an idea of who's probably going to be it, but it just he's double checking. So I can't, I can't say it yet. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do is share my screen here and uh, get started. Hopefully today my PowerPoint works better than last time. I had all these bizarre technical difficulties for those who weren't here last time um, with Brian's PowerPoint. Um, all right, here. There we go. Okay, so for today, um, started with announcements. I got a couple more announcements gonna make. Then I'll give my talk a study in combat. Uh, I sent you guys uh, PDFs of that particular essay, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about where that's going to show up. Uh, and then um, we'll do our discussion of the empty house. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Okay. And. Okay. So first announcement: I wanted to give a shout out to uh, Jay. Uh, Ganguly and several of our members uh, for the excellent proceedings of the Pondicherry Lodge. The, the current issue for June is, I believe, over 200 pages. Uh, it's gorgeous. Uh, she is a, an amazing editor and uh, really some wonderful uh, mm. essays in that particular collection. Okay, so Jay, uh, shout out to you for, for doing such an awesome job on that one. Um, a couple of things just to say that are in that particular issue. Um, I wrote an article on five miles from anywhere uh, that was in there. Uh, it's called How to Stay Connected During a Pandemic, Start a Virtual Sherlock Holmes Society. Um, it's a brief one, but it gives you kind of an update on kind of how we started and some of the, our speakers um, that we've had so far. So um, a number of you guys, I believe both Toms are mentioned in uh, the article, okay? Um, and I just did for uh, 2020. So um, those of you who spoke in 2021, you'll be in the next one. Um, our member, uh, Ron Lees, who could not be here today because of uh, surgery, as Larry mentioned, has a really cool one, also an article in there um, on the relationship between Holmes and Lestrade, uh, where he asks, were they friends? rivals, enemies, or colleagues. And he looks at all the stories and every mention of Lestrade in the canon uh, and talks about that. It's a pretty cool um, essay. And again, and I don't know if I mentioned that the uh, Pondicherry Lodge is free. So you can just uh, download it um, and it's free to all members. And it's free to anybody. So it's really cool. And um, there was also a pretty cool, uh, it's huge. Uh, it's, it's a 50 plus page history of pastichers who have written at least, should say at least, not at last, at least a dozen Sherlock Holmes adventures. Uh, a few of our uh, members are mentioned in the article. Um, a number of us have written a dozen or more, um, but it's a really cool, uh, anything David Markham writes is, is very thorough. Um, and it, it starts really right after Doyle and goes up to today. And it's, it's a really cool um, article. And again, it's, it's like, a quarter of the journal is that article. It's, it's cool. All right. Jay, are you going to, uh, are you, uh, anybody can submit for that art, uh, for your journal. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Anybody awesome. can submit it. The deadline is November 15th. So there's plenty of time. No excuses. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, no excuses. I like how you ended on that one. So November 15th is the deadline. So if anybody wants to write an article uh, on Holmes, any, anybody who 
uh, wants to give it a shot. Maybe you've never done it before and just want to try it out. Um, definitely write something up and send it to Jay. And, and like I said, it, if you haven't seen the journal, it is just gorgeous. She does such a wonderful job. So here's to you, Jay. All right, uh, another uh, thing to mention is last uh, week, uh, Brian gave his talk on Sherlock Holmes and comic books. Um, and a couple of people had said, well, there's some reproductions here and there. Um, and there's one um, particular uh, reprint you can get on Amazon from uh, Guandana Land Comics, which I, pretty sure just reprint stuff that actually is under copyright. I'm not sure yet, uh, but it has a really good uh, reproduction of four of the comics mentioned in our last meeting, and it's a full color reproduction. Um, it's really good. So if you want a, a very affordable full color reproduction of some of the classic uh, Sherlock Holmes comics, um, like the Dell ones, uh, they're in this book. And so easy to find again on Amazon, All right? All right, so um, next up, so I'll get, so now is the talk, <laughs> okay? And um, I know this is kind of um, mm -hmm. loosely connected to the story, but I think it's also essentially connected to um, the empty house. And really it's how was Holmes able to do this? How was Holmes able to uh, defeat Professor Moriarty? How did he get the skills uh, to do this, okay. The essay, uh, saying comment will be in the essential Sherlock Holmes um, that Dan Andriaco has uh, compiled. It's gonna be a three volume anthology of what he considers the most important Sherlock Holmes stories to show the history of Holmes. And they're gonna be put in the, uh, in chronological order. Um, obviously there's some debate about chronology, but pretty much uh, chronological order. Uh, and after every story he says is essential, um, there will be some several essays um, by a number of different um, Sherlockians um, that that will be in there as well. So it should be a really nice collection. He's he's uh, compiled. All right. And so if there's some stuff in the chat. I'm just gonna look at it quick. Okay. Oh, thanks, Jay, for putting that uh, that in there for everybody. <laughs> okay, so really, um, to, to look at Holmes and this idea of him being this expert combatant, I think we have to assume um, that he's been a combatant for quite uh, some time. And in a study in Scarlet, Dr. Watson refers to Holmes as an expert single stick player, boxer, and swordsman, okay? Um, since Watson already refers to Holmes as an expert in these skills in 1881, this is strong evidence that Holmes would have begun his studies in these forms at a young age. Okay, um, it does it. It takes time, um, no matter how good you are at things, to develop and become an expert. I would say at least five years um, to do so. According to um, Baring, William Baring Gould, who's a really good one to start with. Um, he proposed that Holmes started his combat studies in 1868 at the age of 14. I think that's probably pretty accurate because that would give him about 13 years before he met Watson to become an expert in these different areas. Uh, according to Baring Gould, Holmes learned boxing from his father who wanted to make sure his son was tough enough to protect himself from would-be assailants. Um, I would propose um, that Holmes' striking intelligence coupled with his lack, occasional lack of social graces, you know, made him a target for bullies. Um, and that his father probably saw that and saw that potential and really wanted to make sure he could protect his son. Um, possibly also Mycroft with his weight could have also been a target of bullies as well. Um, and again, it just gave him something to um, say, well, I wanna make sure my son does all right. Okay, um, according to Baring Gould, and again, I mean, depends on how much you want to take him, but I think it's pretty, this is a pretty accurate or, or good understanding of how Holmes developed, um, that Holmes's father also had him enrolled in the most celebrated fencing school in Europe, the Salon of uh, Mayor Alphonse Bensin, I believe that's how his name is pronounced, 
Um, and it was under the guidance of Ben Seen that Holmes would have also trained in the single stick. Um, single stick was commonly used as a practice weapon for both the back sword and the saber. So with some fencing, uh, it was common also with fencing to, um, you know, practice with the wooden stick uh, before actually doing uh, the fencing work. Okay. <clears throat> Anyone know what movie that's from? Young Sherlock Holmes. Yes, Young Sherlock Holmes. Okay. Which is really a, <laughs> certainly not canonical, but a really fun movie. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that one. All right. So that kind of uh, explains a lot of what we would call the Western influence on home. So he's learning uh, fathers teaching him boxing, uh, and then he's also learning fencing, um, you know, regular combat, typical things you would have learned um, in, say, a college, um, whichever when he went to um, in that time period. Um, what's a little harder to determine is how he learned, um, you know, the martial arts, okay, the Eastern influence. Um, so he probably learned some Kung Fu, as well as I would say probably Judo would be a good one to think, um, because that one was more uh, around in England. There were, uh, in, in the 1850s, uh, there were some performances of martial arts uh, in, from, from China. Uh, in London, even the queen went to visit and, and saw it and um, that it spread. And as we know from the man with the twisted lip, Holmes had some connection to um, some of the Chinese quarters of London. You know, the opium dens is, is very clear there, but it's probably true that to have some knowledge and, and understand those, he probably also knew just general, um, that whole area. And most likely, um, if he saw some of their combat skills, he would, being a, you know, a sponge for knowledge, he'd want to learn some of this, okay? Um, and so he probably started with some of the, the Chinese ones, but Kung Fu, um, on, you know, while it does have sweeps and kicks and locks, it's a lot more about you use it as a deadly weapon. So a lot of Kung Fu, like when I, I actually got my black belt, we from Shaolin style Kung Fu, um, that is pretty much in the manual. Like you, when you use this, you are using it to kill your opponent. So only use it if it's necessary. Whereas judo isn't quite that bad, okay? And so uh, with judo, uh, it's a lot about knocking the opponent down and, and knocking them down and, and you know, subduing them, which it probably makes a lot more sense for Holmes because he wants to follow British law, okay? You forgot and so most school. likely with Holmes and martial arts, what he was doing um, was using some of that um, Japanese style um, which we know, we know he at least did the Japanese form of wrestling. So I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, and so he did have that background. Derek, uh, Baritsu. Baritsu, but I'm going to talk about that because there oh. is no such thing as Baritsu. <laughs> Baritsu, <laughs> uh, which came well after Holmes returned from the Great Hiatus, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. So for his weapons uh, as well, uh, there are weapons mentioned in the canon. Um, one of the, of course, is the gun. And you know, growing up on a country estate, as has been proposed, Holmes probably started target practice at a very young age. That's a very common thing to do uh, in the country. Um, and while he often asked Watson to carry his trusted Weebly, Holmes had to also been a pretty excellent shot. Uh, as author Benjamin Welton notes, um, although he did not often resort to using them, Holmes almost always carried a pistol um, and was known as being an excellent marksman. Note how he's able to shoot a VR into the flats wall in the Musgrave ritual, which um, to do it and to accurately do the VR with a pistol, um, even at fairly close range, it, it takes some skill, okay? Usually, you know, your, your gun might not be a perfect shot. Um, and so he definitely had some knowledge of guns, but he didn't doesn't look like he liked to use them much. Uh, he much preferred uh, Watson to be the one carrying the gun most of the time. And of course, my favorite, the writing, and his favorite supposedly, the writing crop. Um, it was, Watson mentioned it was, it was Holmes's favorite weapon. Um, 
you know, the, some techniques used to strike opponents in single stick combat and fencing could definitely be applied uh, to the riding crop. Uh, if he did any staff work with martial arts, which is, it, it, it's not clear. And there's no evidence of that in the canon. Um, it would make sense though for him to do some, and it might also make sense for him to do some of the more Eastern style um, sword moves with some uh, sabers, for example. Um, and so the riding crop fits that perfectly. Um, you know, a really good example of using the riding crop as a weapon is when he uses it to strike uh, the gun from the hand of John Clay in the Redheaded League. Um, another similar scene would be uh, him striking at the swamp adder um, in stuff, you know, um, as well would be another good example, so. <clears throat> All right, so uh, blending forms of combat. Um, so Holmes used his knowledge of different combat forms and blended them together to create his own defense system, which I would argue is what Baritsu is, okay? It's his own system of um, combat, okay? Um, this is similar to uh, Colonel Monstery. Uh, some of you may have read his work. Um, he's a 19th century combatant. He traveled the world to learn different fighting forms. Um, he was known, he was mainly a, a fencing teacher, um, but he also served uh, and fought uh, in Mexico and some South American countries in some wars. Uh, a lot of people um, commended him um, for teaching them some good fighting moves. Um, and really, um, you know, I don't know why there's, as far as I know, there's never been a, a pastiche where uh, Holmes met Colonel Monster, but there really should be because uh, they, they're very similar. Uh, in how they fight um, and blending their styles. All right. So that's so now we're kind of getting to Holmes. He's learned everything. He's grown up. He's now an expert. Uh, and now we come to that confrontation at the Reichenbach. Okay. And there's that real plaque. That's a, this is where you know he fought. Moriarty at the falls. So if anyone ever goes there, I haven't, been, I haven't seen it myself, but there is that plaque actually there uh, at the Reichenbach Falls, which is pretty cool. Okay, so again, my first question when we started this was how the heck did Holmes defeat Professor Moriarty, okay? There's a few really important things to note here. Um, first of all, when they meet, to, to, for combat, um, they had a huge amount of respect for each other. I mean, there were things they could have, you know, Moriarty could have easily double-crossed Holmes and he doesn't, which I think is, is really key um, to understanding the relationship between these two. Even though they were complete opponents, they had a lot of respect for each other. Um, a couple of things, Holmes left his walking stick uh, behind, okay? He, did, he didn't use it to fight Moriarty, that, that comes up. Um, Moriarty permitted Holmes to write that letter to Watson. I mean, that's pretty cool <laughs> that he's like, you know, I'll give you a chance. You write your letter to Watson. Um, we'll be fine. Okay. Strikes me as particularly British, don't you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true, Larry. Very, very British. Well, all, uh, you know, all, all, all good form. Good form. Yes, right. Hmm. Uh, another thing that's really interesting is Holmes thought he would die. You know, I mean, he said it in, in both. Um, stories that he did not expect to to live through it okay which says something for Moriarty is Moriarty is the older man um, you know he's a professor that tells us that he's got some really good skills as well okay um, I'd be curious to know more about you know we, we don't know much about Moriarty's background um, and it just be curious to know what he knows uh, in combat that Holmes thought this is it, you know, facing Moriarty, uh, I'm not going to win. <laughs> okay. Or, you know, we're probably both going to have to go over the falls. All right. Now Moriarty was angry, you know, and, and thought probably thought he was going to win. He thought he had this. Okay. Um, there's no indication. Cause I think, you know, I had Moriarty, thought, okay, I'm going to die too, it would have been very easy for him to just throw them both over the falls, okay? Especially with Holmes expecting to, to die. Um, most likely, 
if Moriarty had tried to get them both, I think there's a chance that um, they both would have perished, okay? Um, but Holmes was triumphant. So here's most likely what I think happened. And I am using um, you know, the illustration here. It's, there's a number of them similar to this one. Um, you know, Holmes, Moriarty had his hands around Holmes' throat, which is shown in several illustrations. Um, and all Holmes really would have to do at this point was lower his chin to keep his air passage open. This is a common martial arts one. Lean forward. If he leaned forward, he could break Moriarty's grip. He could rotate his arms outward to break the professor's grip. So kind of going down, I don't know if you guys can see this much, and then kind of breaking the grip that way. And then he could easily push the professor. The professor would lose his balance then uh, and, and fall over the falls. So that's, in my opinion, um, and I've given a, a different talk at a different time on some different scenarios for what it could look like. I think that's the most likely uh, explanation for how he uh, defeated Moriarty. He also, with the arms around him, he could have easily done a spin to get it so that Moriarty had his back to the falls um, and then break the grip. Yeah. Oh. All right. So uh, a couple other notable fights in um, the canon. I mentioned a few. So obviously, Speckled Band um, was a big one where he, he um, fights at the Swamp Adder. Uh, there's also the scene in the Speckled Band when uh, Dr. Roylott twists and bends the poker. And then Holmes takes the poker and bends it back, which is also actually a common uh, martial arts move, OK? In, uh, especially in Shaolin, a lot of people train and, and you call the part of the body you train in, like to strengthen a lot, the iron part. So you'll see things like people with iron neck, which will take a poker and they'll put it around their neck and they'll bend it, okay? Because their muscles really focus on that. Um, when I was in, uh, uh, when I was training uh, in martial arts, some had gone to China and they saw someone who had an iron head. And so what he would do is he would go on cement, do a jump, land on his head and flip up and his head was fine, you know, um, things like that. So that's not an uncommon thing to see. And again, I think that shows his, his training and in, in his Eastern influence um, was early because that story is 1883. It occurs to me that's how Moriarty might have, might have uh, uh, survived. You know, Holmes says he bounced off a rock. Right. But maybe if he had, an, maybe he had an iron head. I don't know. <laughs> it's true. And that, that's the big question. I mean, most, according to the canon, Moriarty did not survive. But as we know from a lot of pastiches, he did. <laughs> All right. Sign of the Four is a classic because we, we have the whole boxing uh, mentioning that he, you know, um, mm. had, had won some amateur boxing, Holmes had. And of course, um, you know, there's lots of fight scenes, cool fight scenes in Sign of the Four. Um, as well. It's a good one. Redheaded League, I'd already mentioned when he, the uh, riding crop, um, hitting the gun out of the guy's hand. Uh, Naval Treaty's got an awesome scene, I think is one of the best examples of martial arts when um, the assailant takes the gun to Holmes and Holmes um, hits him and, and to knock the gun out and does kind of a martial arts kind of lock to get him on the ground. I, I think it's a very classic martial arts scene and it makes me actually wonder how much knowledge Doyle himself had of it because it was a really well-written scene. Uh, illustrious Client has the one stick fighting scene in the canon um, and um, Holmes actually is defeated in it. He gets hit on the head. <laughs> he gets injured. Uh, and, and as I said at my last talk a, few months, at a talk a few months back, I think it shows that Holmes had a difficulty when facing more than one opponent because he does say in that one, oh, it's that second guy. If it wasn't that second guy, I would have done fine. Um, but if there was, but because there was two people he was fighting, he got knocked out. And of course, the scene, the picture here from the solitary cyclist, uh, which you definitely get the Holmes boxing moves uh, in there. The guy takes a swing at him. Holmes pretty much lays him flat. <laughs> All right. And of course, I mean, we could mention some other ones as well. There's a number of different uh, um, cases uh, or, or where Holmes uh, fights 
quite well. So, but these are just a few I wanted to point out. All right. So, um, one of my last, uh, I think it was one of my last slides here, um, is, is really a question. What I, when I was doing this research for this article, you know, one of the things, um, the quote I had was that, you know, Holmes said this was a dangerous profession. The quote I started the um, article with, and it, it makes you wonder, you know, and now he just, he retires just after two decades of service to the law. Um, you know, about 49 when he retires, he's very, very young. Um, and I just wonder if Holmes at that point was realizing his body had slowed with age, his reflexes weren't as sharp. Uh, and despite still being a skilled fighter, he felt he could no longer guarantee his safety uh, nor the safety of Dr. Watson and others and perhaps decided, you know what, it's time to, to retire. Um, you know, par perhaps he also um, continued his work for Mycroft as, as we see in his last bow, for example, which was years later, um, but, you know, in a different way, um, more as like a spy and use it in work. But perhaps I wonder if, if he just felt like, well, maybe it's time to at least semi-retire and to become a beekeeper um, because I cannot maintain um, that I can stay up, keep everybody safe. So that's just a thought. Um, you know, again, I don't have any hard evidence for it, but it's something to uh, consider there. All right. Now, so next up would be the story itself. Okay. Um, does anyone have any uh, questions or feedback for me on my talk? Just because I am still working through the article. I have one more draft uh, to do. Um, did anybody have any thoughts or, or feedback for me? Derek, I've, I've always had a theory, and I wanted to bounce it off you at the group, is so, I, you know, I always give Holmes that he's the smartest man that we probably would have ever met. So knowing that Moriarty was probably not going to play fairly. It wasn't like Moriarty would be like, okay, let's have a gentleman's fight and, you know, and best man wins. And, and that was true because he had, you know, according to the story, Sebastian Moran hiding. And I still think Moran was there to pick off Holmes, you know, himself, if he had gotten a good lucky shot at it. So my thought is if, if Holmes went into this knowing that he was, that Moriarty was going to cheat, Think back to uh, Indiana Jones and the, the iconic scene where the guy with the sword and, and Jones just finally says, how oh, the hell with it, pulls out the gun and shoots him and just gets, gets it over with. Would we have thought a lot less of Holmes if he had just said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to die this way being cheated and just pulled out a gun and shot Moriarty and then said, I'm going to go take a three year hiatus, you know? <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. There's, there's a, a, a novel uh, by David Stewart Davies, where, where he has like the what what really happened at the Reichenbach uh, fall scene, and what really happened is Watson never left, and Holmes and Watson grab each each grab one of Moriarty's forms, and they throw him over the falls. <laughs> Which again, and of course Watson rewrites it so that uh, it, it makes Holmes look a little more noble. Well, I, I know I've always wondered if 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 uh, you know you know you talk about maybe uh, that that uh, they were they were either Moriarty was playing the cheat. Or you know, more, you know, by more, with using Moran or whatever, but you know, Moran, who's 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 a who's a great shot. Uh, try when he try goes to kill Holmes, he just throws rocks at him. So <laughs> it's like, why? I mean, if he had just had it, one of his guns with him, it would have been it would have been all over. Mm. It was a, a crack you know, shot, I, obviously. And and I, I do wonder um, from both of you, but just Steve, getting back to you, I mean. Again, it's it's almost like these two had had a great amount of respect for each other because you would assume that Moriarty would, would be up to something, would have some trick up his sleeve, and he could have, of course, pulled out the gun and shot Holmes. You know, Holmes had his walking stick; he could have easily, you know, used that as a weapon. But yet, the two men, you know, they put they they, they do a gentleman's agreement. He lets him, you know, Holmes puts down his staff. Moriarty write lets him Holmes write that letter to Watson, and then they they have this conflict. And so I think it is interesting that they really didn't, neither one of them really plays a trick, at least according to the version that Holmes well, tells Watson. And, and, and I hate to say, yeah, I was gonna say, we're, we're relying on what Holmes told Watson, you know, in my, in my world, like I said, 
maybe Moriarty pour, pulls a gun out first and Holmes shoots him and over the falls he goes. And then he writes, you know, he writes this nice little note for Watson and says, this is what happened. And, you know, bye. You know, so. <clears throat> but do you think that neither man's ego, and we know they both had one, wouldn't allow either one to cheat? Oh, I, I think Moriarty would be more than happy to cheat because I think he he was so hell bent on killing. I mean, again, he chased him all over, you know, yes, England and, but and we Europe. Not assume that the great Moriarty would kill Holmes. It's not a question. It is not a question. In his mind, in hand to hand combat, he would kill him. He knew he's that. So arrogant. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think it could oh, yeah. be. You know, and as Tommy, you're right, it could, it could be that he was overconfident uh, in his abilities. Um, the and other thing that's Holmes interesting, I mean, at this true. point, Holmes had pretty much won. I mean, he had, he had destroyed uh, Moriarty's gang. He had, he had destroyed the connections. You know, Moriarty was finished. And yet, you know, it makes, and, and he was angry. And yet he did not do anything, in my opinion, or, or at least from what we have, um, to really trick Holmes or, or to, to, to play dirty, he played fair, you know, and even with um, having Moran around, he didn't have more, I mean, it would've been so easy to have them right. face and just have Moran shoot him. <laughs> I mean, he's, a, he's an expert shot, he's right there. He wanted, yeah, he didn't he do probably, it. I, I always think Moriarty probably told Moran, do not bring your gun. Whatever you do, don't bring your gun because, you know, I don't think obviously uh, uh, Colonel Moran was a cheat. I mean, that's the whole point of a of a, <laughs> of a yeah. house. Yeah. Mm. Right. house. Yes, I guess I guess I'm going to go with the uh, being the stereotypical that if if you assume that Moriarty is many years older than Holmes, you know, especially if you buy into that he was his tutor back when he was a kid, plus he was a professor, so he probably didn't get a lot of physical exercise. And the, the third thing is. He had already, you know, he kept up with everything Holmes did. He already had seen that Holmes was pretty good as a physical fighter, you know, just based on the stories that he'd read. And I'm sure he, he had firsthand accounts, you know, of other times when Holmes had, had beat people physically. So, I, again, I, I'm going to go with if, if Moriarty truly wanted Holmes dead and him to survive, I wouldn't put it past him to cheat, you know. And yet, and yet he did. I mean, as far as we know, he didn't, which is, you know, again, I, I find it very interesting. I think it's fascinating about the relationship between these two. Um, what little we know of Moriarty, you know, from really a handful of stories. Right. I, I think they liked having the competition between each other because they didn't find anybody else an equal uh, competitor. Definitely. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that. I think there was one of the reasons I think Holmes did, did his hiatus, I think possibly was just that he was, you know, he felt free after Moria was gone, but also maybe disappointed because he doesn't have that foe anymore. Yeah, or why he re or why he retired at 49. Right. Yeah. There's no great challenges left for the great detective. <laughs> And as we know from the later stories, there really weren't a lot of great challenges. <laughs> how about how about the the story itself? So, what did what did everyone think of um, the empty house, uh, the hiatus in particular? Any thoughts on that? The explanation Holmes gives: Do we do we buy that all he was doing uh, was spending a couple of years hanging out in Lhasa, walking around, and then? researching coal tar derivatives, or do we think he was up to more than that? Uh, you know, pastiche fiction will, will tell you that he was up to way more than that. Yeah, I was gonna yeah. say. That piece is written about homes during the great hiatus. There have been whole collections of, 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 yeah. of, 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 of pastiches dedicated to that. Yeah. So yeah, if, if we take Holmes at his word, we're gonna get rid of half the pastiches out there. <laughs> Well, and, and I look at it that I'm kind of torn in between because on one hand, you know, when, when Holmes talks about how many cases he solved and, you know, there's people that extrapolated that it could have been as many as 1600. Um, and so I can see where he might say, I'm going to take some time off for myself and just see the world and, and 
because I normally don't get a chance to do that, you know, so I, so I could see that, but I could also, I, I also am a little worried that, you know, and I don't remember which story it was where he talks about that. If I, if I leave England for any period of time, basically the whole thing goes to hell in a handbasket that I'm, I'm the only one keeping England from, you know, just going to pot. And so I wonder how in his own mind, how he rationalized being gone for three years, because brings out excitement to criminal classes and undo this. Yeah, there's that ego boy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and, and it's interesting because not only did he disappear for a few years, but he let everyone think he was dead. You know, I mean, it wasn't yeah. even that he was just gone. I mean, he was deceased. And what did, uh, and what did he accomplish with that? Because the, Mor the Moriarty's crew knew it. The, the, well, the and, that, and that's, one of the, that's one of the big questions, right, Larry? Like, yeah. why didn't why didn't Moran like what's spread the, the word? Well, what you know, what was the, what was the point in faking his death and having the hiatus and having the world? But when you know, it would make sense if Moriarty if Moriarty's gang didn't know he was alive, but they obviously did. And that's why he kept undercover all that time. But I guess it was made him hard to find. Maybe there I would admit that Sherlock Holmes was a very selfish person. And I think that can be shown in a number of different ways. I mean, all right, start with the way he treats Watson. Yes. This is his best friend. He's And he's dead and he keeps it from him. Okay, I'll buy that. How does he come back? You know, he comes back with the actress. He doesn't just, you know, come in and gently break it to Watson hey, you know, I'm back, this really, uh, no. He shocks the man so badly that he passes out for the first and only time in his life. Well, his fear for the static is documented, for sure. Well, and at least, uh, Tom, at least he didn't uh, dress up as, at least he didn't dress up as a waiter with a fake mustache. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, a bookseller, that's close enough. Yeah. Uh, uh, but he does but, the same thing to Mrs. Hudson. Yeah, yeah. But the other thing is, Good homes have just been selfish enough that he saw the demise of Moriarty as the perfect opportunity to do things a different way. You know, who says he didn't come back to England? He does. Right. Well, I mean, he was there for like 10 years before Watson published the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Came yeah. back in 94. And you know, the when was the story published? I don't I don't know offhand. 19. I think 1903 or 1904, yeah. yeah so it was like 10 years he was back yeah. before Watson let the public in on it. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I mean, obviously some people must have known that he was back. But well, it must have been. He solved, a lot, he solved a lot of cases in that 10 years. Yeah, he did. Yeah. I, that's true. Yeah. Well, well I, yeah, I, I, I would think the, yeah. Well, while the story was published later, I think most people knew that, that Holmes had um, returned. So, you know, yeah, I mean, th there's lots of questions. There's so many questions, like, uh, like especially the Moriarty gang knowing, you know, what was left of the Moriarty gang knowing that Holmes was alive. It just seems like it would have spread throughout London, the under, you know, that the, the underworld would have at least been like on the lookout for him. There would have been rewards for his head. Um, and the, through that, the force would have found out that he was alive. And you'd think eventually Watson would have found out since he was still doing, Watson was still doing some cases as we find out um, in, the, in the beginning of this story. So there's, lo there's lots of questions there. The question, why, why was Moran throwing rocks at Holmes when he's an expert shot? Right. Um, what was Holmes doing uh, in, you know, in Lhasa for uh, two years? Um, a number of people, um, myself included, uh, wonder if he was Im improving his meditation um, and some of the skills there, um, and also just kicking his habit of, of injecting himself. Um, it would be a good place to do that. And maybe that was part of the reason for the hiatus to, to get healthy. In any of the pastiches following this, do we ever learn the origin of tree worship? <laughs> <laughs> Of all, of, all, of all books, right? Yeah, why, why that book, right? That, that's right. the book he shows. He's oh. got, he's, he, hey, Watson, you want to buy the, the origin of, the, of, of tree worship? What, one of the reasons I always liked this story was because, um, Vin, uh, because of the role of Mrs. Hudson. Uh, 
uh, you know, Vincent Starrett uh, wrote a, a, a great article and, and he kept it as a chapter of his book, The Private Life of Sherlock Holmes, all about Mrs. Hudson and, and, and what she was like as a person. And, uh, but the thing is, he, you know, he loves that she's crawling. He sees her crawling around on her knees, turning the statue and, you know, picking up the exploded bullet off the floor. Here it is, you know, in, in cold blood. I mean, she's, she's really uh, quite dynamic. It really, really shows her in her best light. And, uh, and there's, you know, cause there isn't a lot of dialogue for Mrs. Hudson in the canon, really. They, you know, the, the uh, uh, Jeremy Brett, you know, the adaptions put a lot more in there for yeah. her because they like her, they like the idea of her, but uh, really she rarely ever says anything. But in, the, in this one, she does. She has a whole interaction with Sherlock Holmes. So it's really- but, and, and this, of course, leads to the question of, is uh, Mrs. Hudson, old Martha in his last bow, who has now become a, a secret agent, a spy? Right. Um, you know, is, is this showing there was a lot more to Mrs. Hudson than meets the eye? Well, or how, how, what was her age? Approximately right. to, compared right. to Holmes, right. you know, you know, we always she's always depicted as being maternal, you know, an older lady. But maybe you know, some some pastiche writers have speculated she was a young girl, and that uh, Holmes actually has been having an affair with her through his entire career. Right. And, and except, <laughs> you know, I know, I know the uh, there was a Russian TV series of Holmes a couple of years ago, and, and she was quite young, uh, about his age in, in that particular. Uh, interpretation right. yeah it never says it never says how old she is it never really mentions it yeah you know, you know, one, clue, one, clue, one clue that i have that i think that we give moriarty's group too much credit i've always thought that you know in the um final problem holmes talks about that they, that moriarty's group set fire to the ha to to their rooms you know but yet three years later when he comes back he basically says the rooms looked exactly like when I left them. Well, <laughs> with, with, with all that paper in there, you know, I mean, he has the uh, the lumber room packed full of paper and all the paper. Moriarty's group's not very good if they can't set a fire and burn down a room. You know, so. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, if, if they knew he was alive and they wanted to bring him back, and I mean, I have an evil mind. I would have gone after Mrs. Hudson. I would have gone after Watson. Right. You know, that gets back to home. What's he going to do? Sit in Tibet? Uh, would have showed up. Yeah, you're, yep. you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to think this is this shows that Holmes was the worst tenant in London. First of all, he disappears. He allows everyone to think he's dead and, bed, dead, dead and buried. Then he walks in on his landlady and he says, oh, by the way, someone's going to take a pot shot at me and you're going to end up with a window. That's true. Uh, <laughs> you know, or Watson says that he, she could have retired with, you know, he paid, evidently paid so much money to her uh, to rent that place, given all, all the problems uh, with having yeah. in it, that uh, she could have retired with a princely sum. Dilapidations uh, money. Yeah. So from, from, a, for, from, from a forensic standpoint, because I've, I've never been, obviously, to the Rackenbach Falls, but has anybody ever looked into... If two bodies went over the falls, would they completely disappear? I mean, is, I mean, where does where does that water flow to? I mean, is it, or I, to me, I just think that the bodies would have shown up sooner or later downstream somewhere. You know, probably described as a cauldron. So, mm. Yeah, but you're still gonna. I mean, I mean, you're gonna die and drown, but you'd still. I would think you would pop up sooner or later. You know. I mean, there's always a chance that the body might resurface but it might not necessarily be found by anyone like it might wash up somewhere and just you know the scavengers get to it before any searchers right. do and yeah. that's one saying i don't know where yeah, that, maybe i, I could find some bleach blowns they don't know who it is i don't know where that water goes after it comes down the falls i mean does it join into a big river or is it just you know trickle uh -huh. down into the town or you know it just trickles down actually. So uh, I've been to Reichenbach a couple of times. It's not a very big waterfall. Oh. So oh. I am not very sure if people would even die if they fall from the cliff where that Oh tell us that, Jay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything. You mean Arthur Conan Doyle wasn't completely accurate about something? <laughs> <laughs> oh come on, a ten foot fall will kill you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this, you're supporting my theory of the gunshot. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Uh, what did you guys think of uh, Holmes's take on the fours on, on Lestrade? I mean, he's, he said, you know, at first he's like, you know, strong three murders that are unsolved. <laughs> yeah, but there's this one you did a really good job on. Yeah. So I mean, was he getting nicer? Uh, maybe is this like the the start? I mean, of, of Holmes and showing his respect towards uh, yeah. Lestrade by giving him at least some credit, or is he you still know, by, like Watson like, goes goes out of his way? I think to show that he's still. The same old bad, poorly tempered, impatient, irritated Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> he makes, you know, he makes sure he shows how he's you know doesn't have a lot of patience with slower minds and and uh, and, and 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 such. Um, also, well, what what impresses me though in this story is the speed of Holmes's thinking. I mean, he figured out that whole business about faking his own death while Moriarty was falling down the waterfall. By the <laughs> you know. It, but I know he th he thought and even though even though Holmes studied crime, you know, throughout his life, uh, you know, one possibility is during this three years where he was traveling all over, you know, the continent and everything else, maybe he got to see how bad other police forces were in other countries and, and how little they did. And so maybe he did come back with a little more respect for Scotland Yard and say, you know, you aren't too bad after all compared to what I've seen <laughs> in other places. So <laughs> Um, you know what one other I, I was looking at my notes and one other thing I did write down for um, the Colonel Moran throwing the rocks at Holmes is Holmes actually for once says he's not sure it is it was Moran who threw the rocks at him he says I, I'm almost certain it was but he's not 100% oh, sure Moran. so Moran. it could possibly be that it was someone else who has looked similar or you know you know it was a distance from he's looking up at the guys throwing rocks at yeah. him. So maybe this is a different member of Moriarty's gang um, who did inform Moran. Um, and maybe it took him a while to get to back to England. And so maybe that's one way we could say why his knowledge of him still being alive hadn't spread so quickly. Yeah, he, he, he seemed to know, but he, I guess he, he thought Moran was one of the two that escaped the police dragnet. When, when they when they put so he seemed to know who they, those people were but I don't know if that's why he thought it was Moran throwing the rocks but well, he claimed he you know was afraid of air guns and um, naturally as soon as he gets back and makes it public what happens Moran comes and shoots at him with an air gun right. and it provides a pretty good explanation for why he left in the first place because who wants you know who wants to be under that kind of a threat every day? And actually, the odds are that he's going to get you, you know, presumably with the murder of Adair with an air gun. Now Holmes knew where Moran was, what he was doing, and he could set right. him up. But if he didn't have that, he may have been the one who was, was killed. Yeah. Right? I, I well, it would make sense that he would, he would go on the run. That's oh, so you have to assume that Moran, you know, is, is fairly intelligent and realizes if I go straight back to England, I'm going to get arrested because they're, they're wanting to pull in everybody in the gang and my leader has just been killed. So maybe it's better if I stay over here on the continent for a couple of years until things die down, you know. Yeah, I think, yeah. Dana, you were going to say something? Yeah, the, the fact that Moran is you know, at liberty and, you know, killing people three years after Reichenbach. Um, it seems to me like, I mean, since he wasn't caught in the initial sweep and presumably, you know, the police did not have sufficient evidence to just arrest him. It seems like Holmes really did have to set up a situation where they could catch Moran, you know, in the act of actually trying to kill someone. That might probably be due to the, the fact that he appears to be someone of comparatively high status. You know, he's, he's a club man. You know, yeah. he's a, a very well-known, well-regarded, you know, veteran. You know, his, his bag of tigers is still unrivaled. Yeah. You know, th th this guy's got <laughs> yeah. a rep, you know, yeah. in society. I think Shannon's got it. That's really probably yeah, I that agree. Makes sense to me. Uh, and he was obviously, you know, walking around and, and I mean, professionally, he was a professional gambler. He was cheating. But on the other hand, he doesn't just like step in and take over the network. So it seems like, you know, enough people were caught that he couldn't just, right. you know. 
Well, again, yeah, Holmes says it was just the two of them. It was just two people. Holmes said. You know? And maybe that's not his aspiration either. Moran yeah, was he just, yeah. not, not a leader in a criminal mastermind. No. So, so I would like to turn, to, I would like to turn to my legal advisor, Mr. Krasunas, again. Um, I am curious. So what would you have finally probably been able to charge and convict Moran on at the end of this story? Because, I mean, is it really attempted murder to, to shoot an air gun at a wax figure? <laughs> No, well, it, if you're mistaken, uh, that doesn't. I mean, his intent is what the is what the crime is. His intent yeah. is to kill him. Um, and and so, you know, it'd be like uh, uh, coming to a house and throwing a Molotov cocktail into a house, thinking that Steve Mason's in there, uh, um, <laughs> and, then, and then I find out that you're not there. <clears throat> So the, you know the the crime was the assault. Um, although you know, but it doesn't actually, assault have to be against a person. Yeah, see, yeah, the, I mean, the assault is really placing a person in fear, and you wouldn't be in fear, so you probably you probably wouldn't be. Uh, but Holmes was in the house, wasn't he? No, he was in the empty uh -huh. house. He was in the empty house. house. Yeah, it probably, you know, it would probably be some type of, uh, it might not be assault with intent to murder then. It might be uh, in Michigan, I know we have, uh, you know, firing a, a weapon into a dwelling house. So it would still be a serious crime. It, well, it was attempted murder. It was attempted. Is, Rich, is that, is, do you think that's why Holmes was like, get him on the, the Adair murder instead of the attempted murder as well. I mean, he's, he's, he did say that now we've got, with the gun, we have the evidence that this was the murder weapon. Right, right. Uh, okay. That makes sense too. So that-, well, that I, I was looking the other day for um, a pastiche. Comparative ballistics really didn't come out until the 1930s when the comparison microscope was first invented. Uh, now, Holmes, one of the things I like to do in pastiche is to sort of pioneer him as, you know, with some of these techniques. But the point is, is that it wouldn't have been as easy to identify, especially if the bullet was flattened, which it was, to say that it definitively came from that gun. Well, you know, it, they kept referring to it as a, as a pistol bullet. Right. Which, which, which you know, I... The whole, you know, which is what one part of the mystery was. It didn't seem like a long distance weapon. I had a man from Uncle Gun with a pistol with a stock. Mm, okay. There's something about this story that I've always wondered about. You know, it's titled, you know, The Empty House. Why is there an empty house across from 221B Baker Street? Like, how possible <laughs> is that? Because the I mean, McDougal twins hadn't moved in yet, <laughs> maybe maybe that's one of maybe that's one of Holmes's five refuges where he hides out. He just didn't he hadn't told anybody about it yet. Wait, no, he just bought it and emptied it out, so Moran would have a place to go. He thinks that bolt holes. I, I think there's also just the fact that I mean, it, it could have just you know been in transition. Someone moved out. Someone hadn't moved back, moved in yet. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I don't think it's that uncommon for a house to be empty be between owners. But this and this story is about that trans transition. The empty house is really 221B because Holmes hasn't moved back in yet. Oh, there we go. Ooh. I like that. That's true. Yes. That's another true. way of looking at it. Yeah. Mm. Out, out of curiosity, we're, we're almost out of time here. Is, I, I'm wondering is, has anybody read the it's, it's a manga and there's also an anime series called Moriarty the Patriot? I've heard of it, I haven't seen it. I, it's really interesting. I read the first three graphic novels just as research for this, and, and it, the, the author proposes that all Moriarty, Moriarty hates the British class system and that his motivation is he starts the criminal enterprise <clears throat> to bring down the, the class system. He wants to level the class system, bring down the upper class. That's his motivation for it, that he wants to show that the upper class cannot keep the commoners safe. So therefore, people need to rise up to overthrow the system. It, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, and what I like about it is it does not portray him as a good person. I mean, he, he does things to help the poor, 
but he's definitely a, a cold-blooded killer. Bring, um, bringing down the class system interested. is hardly a patriot. What's Somebody, that? Uh, <laughs> someone who, who's, who's, whose goal is to bring down the class system would hardly be viewed as a patriot. Well, certainly not in this time period, right? <laughs> Depends. Right. It depends on which system of government you're looking through. So it, it, I just found it. It's pretty interesting, um, and and it does get into a bit the Holmes Moriarty relationship as kind of a, a cat and mouse, or them looking at each other as equals. So I, I I'll be curious. I, it's enough that I want to read the rest of the series. So it's interesting. I don't think there's any evidence for it in the canon, but I thought it was an interesting take well, uh, on the were, characters. What's there's that, that pastiche series. Uh, there is a Moriarty. Cash Caesars. I can't think of who the. There's a few of them, but I can't. Yeah. I can't think of who the uh, the writer is. Talking about the one that's the Return of Moriarty and the Revenge of Moriarty. No, not not those two. And that one, he really is a bad guy. Yeah. But his, <laughs> his other ones, he's actually more of a Mycroft, and that he right. he's, he's just a little bit. He's just not corny, you know, like Sherlock Holmes. He's just more practical, but really, he's he's. Uh, uh, I, I can I can go run over to my bookshelf and see who, who wrote it. <laughs> I, I think I know which ones you're, you're talking I, I, about. Oh, I'm going to do it. So go ahead. <laughs> and I think this is the this is the story where Mycroft is referred to as M, um, which is where the James Bond connection is as well. Because um, it, 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 at one point, um, I believe Holmes refers to Moriarty uh, to Mycroft as M in this one. Um, and I know that. The author of James Bond did base M off of off of uh, Mycroft Holmes, so I thought that was interesting too. Derek, I've got to run to uh, Toronto for another meeting. Yeah, um, I know a lot of them. Are, a lot of them happen. <laughs> I understand. I, I just have one question because uh, I go to a lot of different meetings, and they always mention your book company, and they mention you. Okay. And the question has come up: How do you pronounce your last name? So I oh, want to. Get <laughs> it's Belanger. Belanger. Yes. Very good. Wow. Hey, look what came in the mail I even close. Oh, Woo! she's got it. <laughs> That's in, one of our Texas, latest the, ones. In Michael Texas, Curley. by the way, it's Bell it's oh. Bellinger. Yeah, it, and, yeah and, they're and, all wrong. <laughs> in Montreal, <laughs> what are we gonna do? <laughs> oh, uh yes, yeah, so in the boulanger, of course. <laughs> Oh, there it is, Larry. Who's the author? Michael Curlin. Oh, Curlin. That's right. Yeah. He did, a big, he did a, 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 like three or four or five uh, books uh, mm -hmm. of, of uh, Moriarty. And, and, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty good. Cool. All right, everyone. Uh, it's 11. Um, so again, we, we'll be back in August. I'll let you guys know, I should know pretty soon who the speaker is going to be in August. It's not 100% uh, certain yet, uh, but I'll let you know. Um, so yes, uh, next month we have a little uh, a little reprieve, <laughs> a little break, our own uh, summer hiatus, uh, but we'll be back uh, in August um, and and probably going forward. I think the rest of this year um, again first Saturday of the month. Okay, um, thank you everybody. This has been a wonderful time as always, and I will uh, see you again in August. Take care. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. 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 Bye